Welcome to Love and Murder. I'm your host, Kai, along with my co-host, Shar. For tonight's episode, grab your pen, paper, and detective's coat, and be prepared to take notes. It's a he said, she said, he said. It's the case of Eric McLean, right now on Love and Murder. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder. You know, somebody told me to stop saying good evening, but that's like my signature line. So because they're like, they're like, people might not be listening to it in the evening. And I'm like, so? Couldn't well, work. but they have a it's good evening point. somewhere. It's five o'clock somewhere. I don't care. <laughs> Ask Jimmy yeah, about I mean, it. I say good evening. I've been saying good evening for eight years now. I know, but I guess, but we, I don't but know. we have people that listen from literally all around the world, different other countries besides America. I get their point, but we can't, okay. but we can't make all everybody right. happy we'll though. Because then the, the people in the, in the morning will I say, mean, but it's evening or it's afternoon or it's another day. So, you know, uh, yeah, I say evening all the time, but I can say hello, everyone. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I've said it like this for so long. Anyways, welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong. And when I say terribly wrong, how wrong do I mean? Where's my canned music when you need it? Dum, dum, dum. She means dead wrong. Dead I am your host, Kai, and this is my co-host, the gorgeous, the tall, the big-breasted. <laughs> I like that one. That's a, that's a little different. Yeah, you never mentioned that. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't see my hand movements, though. <laughs> I was squeezing boobies. <laughs> She's squeezing boobies. <laughs> and don't ask how large listeners, because I'll never get that in- information. But they're big. They're huge. <laughs> I mean, you could basically see them if you go to our Facebook fan page, which is a Love and Murder fan page. You could just see how big they really? are. Anyways, I don't even remember that? Yeah, you have videos I don't in there. That. This is the weirdest intro. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> well, at least they know they're this in the right show. This is my co-host Char. Like boobs are people yeah, are right? Like, are like, oh yes. Yes, I'm in the right podcast. I knew it was this one. <laughs> We're going to have a bunch of people joining right. our fan page. <laughs> Anyways, our show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery, suspense, and just a little bit of humor sprinkled on top. So I have to say this, and I was trying not to say this because another show that I love, 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 they always say the disclaimer, and I was trying not to bite off of them. However, we always have these people with S's on their chest, which stands for stupid, yes. who don't listen Super to the whole stupid. show, and then they just they just make assumptions. So basically, what I'm going to say is if you don't like your true crime mixed in with humor, if you don't think there should be laughter when you're talking about murder or anything like that, then this is not for you. We do not laugh about anything that has to deal with the victim. We do not laugh about, you know, it, the, the, the humor comes from if the police force did something stupid or even like the thought of I'm going to murder someone, you know, that's like, what? Are you crazy? These are the things that where the humor America's comes from. America's dumbest so, criminals. That's, and that like I, she that's said. what I always have to say because that's what there's an entire show dedicated to America's dumbest criminals. And believe me, I'm pretty sure they're laughing too. But if you think we should sound all somber and sad, radio silence, talking about bored. yes, this is how we yes. should sound in our podcast all the time, then this isn't the place for you. So. Anyways, check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Everybody has an issue with Spotify right now. So if you don't want to check us out on Spotify, you could check us out on Stitcher. You could check us out on Apple Podcasts. You could check us out on Google Podcasts. Like, we are everywhere. Like the plague. <laughs> anyway, follow us on social media. The links are in the show notes below, but we'll be set at the end of the show. If you want to be a part of our l m exclusive community, then join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash love and murder when you join you'll get commercial free episodes of love and murder you also get bonus episodes every two weeks of crazy crime america's even more dumbest criminals um behind the scenes relationship advice right now we have seth pravicki the interview with seth pravicki where i'm reading oh, that right. interview yeah, the transcript and we also the... have yeah 
the official. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we also have the January bonus uh, behind the scenes, so our bloopers, so you get that also. So that's what's there right now, including a lot more, because, you know, that's just what's there from January, but there's a lot more. So if you just go to patreon.com forward slash love and murder to join us, it's only $3 a month right now. And when the price get goes up, you'll be grandfathered in. If you listen to our show before, or even at the end of this episode, and you like it, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or <laughs> or Spotify if you're still on Spotify and give us five stars. Say whatever you want in the description, but it helps bring us up in the chart so everyone can go ahead and find us and listen to the show just like you. But the easiest way to rate us is to just simply go to our website, murderandlove.com. That's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com and choose rate us in the menu above. So With all that out of the way now, tonight we're talking about the case of Eric McLean. This one here is a crazy love triangle that's going to basically have you saying, what? Or as Char says, what the, what the? (laughs) (laughs) So before we begin, though, I want to give a shout out to one of our amazing fans. Her name is Cindy G. And I just want to say, Cindy, thank you for being you. We wanted to let you know that we really, really appreciate you. Yay, Cindy. Where's... Okay, we need bullhorns. Oh, that's good. That's good. Wow, you're a great sound effects lady. I didn't realize that. (laughs) All right. Now, if you missed the last episode, it was something new we're doing with season two. At the end of every month, we are going to be doing an episode on missing people from every state. So one missing person from every state for that month. With these episodes, we really, really, really ask that you listen. They're not long. And share, share, share. So the January episode was the first of these, and it was extremely heartbreaking for me. Most of the missing persons were kids, and the youngest one was an, was only three years old. Oh, that's right, hi. That that episode was just moving. It was very, it was heartfelt. Yeah, it was. It was. Really you hard. did an excellent job, and I really wish you guys would definitely check that out because you never know. Sadly, it could be you know one of our listeners, uh, their 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 families or their own children. So. It's definitely worth, you know, following that. But Kai, you did an amazing job, especially being that the subject line was so difficult. As much as we talk about very difficult stories, when it comes to these missing people mysteries, you don't know if they're dead. You don't know if they're alive or they're being held somewhere and they can be released and they can be found. There's just so many questions. It's just so, so dark yeah. and just sad, but it's what's happening you know, so we, we really have to think about that. Yeah. I mean, my whole thing is I just just want to help somebody. Yeah. You know in some and way. It can make if a difference. we could even help bring one person home, that would be amazing. So Did, didn't we have an update, Kai, from when you were in the middle of that show? I mean, it was in the middle of the show. I, I don't remember. But one of them was found. It was um, a senior. I can't okay. remember his yes, age, but he senior, was yes. found. OK, that's really good. Um, news. And periodically, obviously, I'll go back and look to see uh, if anyone was found and updated on our website. So if you wanted to see any pictures of the individuals who are missing, uh, you know, or find out more information, you can go to our website again, www.murderandlove.com and just go to cases and you'll see the, the episode there with all the links and everybody's names. For you to be able to share, for you to be able to listen and share, go back to episode 42, which was called January Missing People. Listen and share, please, please, please. So we just want to get these people home. Yes. Now, switching gears, on to business. Jason Eric McLean was born in 1975 in Knoxville, Tennessee to Norman McLean and Tanya McLean. He was one of seven children. Good Lord. Can you imagine that, having seven children, Char? Actually, I know a family that had um, 18 kids. We were just talking about it today. Like their mother and father had 18 children. Mm, uh, yeah. No, no, no mm-hmm. absolutely not. Anyway, <laughs> Eric, as everyone called him, had four brothers and two sisters. He was a very, very outgoing boy, um, you know, growing into an outgoing man. Everyone said that he was always smiling and everyone loved being around him. And as he got older, he got into drumming and he decided to be a, hand, a high school uh, band director. In 1993, 
At the age of 18, he met a 16-year-old girl who went to his school. So basically, he was a senior and she was what, a sophomore? 16, you're a sophomore, right? Yeah, that's about right. Do you find that's anything right. wrong with that age difference? No, what was his age again? He's 18, she's 16. So he's a senior, she, she's a sophomore. I don't see anything wrong with high school love after ninth grade of any age, as long as you're still in high school. I mean, because, mm. so, you know, some kids are older as a senior, uh, 18 and a half, even even 19, possibly. And then, you know, and others are younger as a senior. Do you see what I mean? But as long as you're still in. Yeah, high but school, I was in high school at 14. So you're saying me being 14 and somebody being 19 would be OK. No, 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 no. I said other than a, I said other than um, starting like at a sophomore, not a freshman, oh, not ninth okay. grade. Okay. Yeah, that's too young. In my opinion, that's too young to be dating anyone else in your high school. Well, then let's switch gears. As a sophomore, I was 15. So you're saying it would be okay for me to be with a 19-year-old? No, but once again, you're not in 10th grade, at least in 10th grade, whatever your age That's what I'm saying. As a sophomore, I was 15. Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, but you were turning 16 soon. I'm sure you were on the cuff, you know. When you you entered that year, you were probably 15 and a, a quarter or something. About to per- turn 16 in a couple of months. I mean, come on, Kai. What are the chances that you're 15 in 10th grade going towards 11th grade, towards the end of the school year? You're going to turn 16. I graduated high school at 17. So. Okay, you look, look, you got an early start, lady, okay? You got an early start. You, they probably skipped you twice, for all we know, <laughs> up to a higher grade. <laughs> From fifth grade. Oh, I'll put her in seventh grade. She's in fifth grade. Oh, she's a genius. So, yeah. Well, I'm not a genius, but... <laughs> just yeah anyways um Erin Myers was born in 1977 in Knoxville as well her parents divorced when she was young and she lived in different homes basically going between fr- friends and family then she came to live with someone and basically that made her end up in Knoxville Tennessee uh so she, you know she started in Knoxville moved around and then got back to Knoxville uh her friends and family described her as a free spirit non-conformist and she was just brilliant and loved literature, jo- uh, drama, and theater. Eric graduated first, of course. And as soon as Aaron graduated, they decided they needed to move in together. So they saved enough, enough money and bought a home. And then they started their lives. Aaron got pregnant soon after that. And for whatever reason, they broke up. You know, young, young people. Young you love. Know. So they broke up. And their breakup was just really, really short. And so they ended up getting back together. And then in 1998, uh, they had their first son named Eric McLean Jr. So he was a junior. And then after that, they got married. Eric Sr. stopped going to college so that Erin can go to school at the University of Tennessee to get her bachelor's in English. So he put his dreams on hold so she can pursue her dreams. And after graduating with her bachelor's, she then won a scholarship for an English program at Indiana University for her master's in English literature. And that program was a very, very competitive program, but she ended up winning a scholarship. So, you know, that means she was really, really smart. Yeah. They packed up the family and they moved to Bloomington, Indiana to, again, support Erin in her dreams. To me... That sounds like an amazing husband. That's just I was me. just going to say, and the award goes to... Right? <laughs> wow, where do you even hear these stories anymore, you know? So basically, he worked and supported the entire family, put his dreams on hold, all so his wife could fulfill her dreams. And like you said, not many people are like that anymore, you know? No. Not many people think about themselves, usually. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Now, even though they had financial issues at the time, they ended up having another kid. And it was another son, and they named him Ian. Now, in 2006, they moved back to Knoxville, and Eric was able to return to college uh, to work towards his dream of earning a degree towards becoming a band teacher. While he went to school, he worked a bunch of jobs to be able to afford the bills. He delivered pizzas, he drove taxis, stuff like that, just odd and wow, end Wow, amazing. Yeah, he would take his work either. No, not at all. He he needed to support his family. He's not a piece of trash. (laughs) But it's but it's finally his turn though. It's like his turn to go towards his dream. Yeah, but she's also still in college herself. So he would take while he was at work, he would take his books with him and study when he had time. Then when he got home, he would get the kids ready for school, take them to school, go back to work 
get off, go get the kids from school and bring them home, then get a couple hours of sleep before going back to work. And on and on in and school, on and every studies, day. And studies in between that too, because he was in exactly. school. Exactly. Erin at oh. the time didn't like her job, so de- she decided to quit and go back to school. Okay. So I guess she had graduated and she went back to school. But, you know, Eric wasn't kind of not happy with this because this was supposed to be his turn going to school. Yeah. But he supported her decision because he's uh, from all appearances here. He seems like a good husband. Yeah. So Erin started working towards her second master's degree and also started a student teaching internship at West High School in Knoxville. So, you know, she quit her job. She got an internship, which not every internship is paid. So we don't know if she was getting paid. And she's going to school for a second master's while Eric is basically paying all the bills. So this is what's going on right now. So basically a normal schedule for Eric was to wake up at 6 a.m., do everything I previously said, get home at midnight, do schoolwork, sleep for a couple hours and be back up at 6 a.m. If I had that schedule, I I, I would literally die. I would literally die. That's crazy. So basically gets two to three hours of sleep. Yeah. (laughs) By the time he actually falls asleep, it's time to get up. It's time to wake up. There's that alarm clock. And I know there are people out there with that kind of schedule. So I'm going to tell you this. Mm -hmm. I commend whoever is doing a schedule like that. Clearly you're stronger than me in that regard because it's not happening. If I don't get minimum seven hours of sleep consistently i get sick i just get sick it's just seven? my body you have to get seven that's what the average i have to get to seven get asleep. if i get if i get less than seven i i get sick i end up getting sick even so my husband just, knows yeah, that your he'll be like what time like, are you no. going to bed blah 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 you yeah. need to get to bed because he knows i don't want I you to be sick. cranky and sick tomorrow <laughs> 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 because he knows it's coming Oh, no, I'm good at five because if I sleep over that, then it makes me groggy, tired, exhausted. I have to get up before that. If I sleep over that, you can forget it. Then I'll probably get sick because I slept too long. Good <laughs> Lord. Only five hours of sleep. Yeah, that's it's perfect, crazy. though. It's perfect. It, to me, that's perfect. You're refreshed. And I get it. You know, it's still dark. I outside. would feel I love that. so tired. Oh, my God. No. I well, mean, but everybody's different, clearly. So for Aaron and eric so far it sounds like you know they don't have time for each other school no. work school work financial issues school children work school and more work but isn't that the average couple these days though or no well that wasn't these days but isn't that just the average couple that are going towards certain goals and have a family and that are working also or you know in school i mean that's just i mean who do you know that's not that busy anymore I you mean, know, it's not it's not Ozzy and Harriet in the 1940s. Almost everyone has to almost both, you know, the the husband and wife have to work, have to work. Many people do have children opposed to not. And a lot of a, a lot because because work is not enough necessarily to just pay to have an amazing life. You usually want better. So it's like I have to go to school. I just don't see I don't really know many people who don't deal with that same scenario though do you Kai I mean I know a lot of people who are very busy but they do find time for each other in their relationship really yeah I Mm. mean that's what I know I don't know (laughs) so but without time as we're talking about without time for your marriage without time for each other it's just you doing your life the other person doing their life and the only time you meet in the middle is when you're taking care of the kids. So without date nights, without romance, you know, that basically spells what in a marriage? Trouble. T R O U B L E, trouble in yeah. the marriage. Yeah. So, enter trouble. Sean Powell was born in 1988 and was raised by his mom until he was 6. He never knew his birth dad. And at 6 years old, due to drug use and prostitution, His birth mom gave him up for adoption. Sean ended up being in and out of foster homes and in foster care, he didn't have, you know, a very good childhood. In one home, he was kept in a closet. In another home, he was molested. He ate his food as if he were in prison. Like, you know how they kind of hold their hand over their plate, like hide in your plate and just trying to really scoop up the food really quickly. Oh my gosh. That's how, yeah, that's how he ate. Um... He just did that so he could, you know, finish his food and no one else would take his food. So 
After a while, his mother's parental rights were terminated and then he was able to be adopted by another family and their name was the Powell family. There, he was raised with his adopted family, but he was raised under the assumption that his birth mother had died. So he thought all this time that his mom was dead. He didn't know that she just gave him up for adoption. And after he got um, adopted, things were good for a while. And, you know, his family and friends described him as, you know, very athletic, very outgoing. He loved to party and he loved four wheeling and stuff like that. He was also a good rugby rugby player, and he was really, really good at rugby. However, over time, his personality turned erratic, and the Powell sent him off to a therapeutic boarding school. After a year and a half, the school said, yeah, he's good. <laughs> he was, they were just like, ah, he's good now. And they discharged him, and he came back home. When he was 17 years old, his birth mother found him, and basically came back into his life. So imagine that shock. You think your mom's dead. And she's like, hey, I'm your mom. Mom, I'm pretty much alive oh, now. Oh, jeez. But after he's already been raised. You know, yeah, like, let me I, tell you why I did. Do? Let me tell you why I gave you up, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're so... almost grown. But let me just ra- let me take it from here. Like, yeah, right. Oh, cow- very cowardly. I just don't agree with that. It's terrible. But she did say that once she got herself back together, she had begun searching for him and she had like never given up searching for him. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's good because she could have just left him where he was or not given him a, a second thought. No, so, but he was up, but he was 17. So that's why I'm not okay with but that. But she was searching for him. It's not like she was just like, oh, I'll just come back when he's 17. She couldn't find oh, him. Oh, she didn't find, couldn't find him. But she should have found him when he was being abused in two homes prior to that. Well, she was on drugs. So she kind of oh, wasn't thinking about that. Right. So in school, teachers and students said that Sean drank while at school. He smoked and he wasn't shy to like get in teachers' faces and tell him what he thought of them or tell him what he thought of whatever. So he kind of had, he kind of grew into this type of personality, which stems from his childhood, just how, you know, how horrible his childhood was. Right. In the fall of 2005, he met and bonded with his student teacher named Aaron McLean. They both had an interest in drama and poetry. So that's what they often talked about. Aaron said she felt a kinship with Sean because, you know, she'd faced the same struggles when she was his age. However, in October 2006, Sean was expelled from the school when he was caught in the parking lot with alcohol. In December, his adopted parents then sent him off to rehab for alcohol abuse, and then he was kicked out of his house. During this tough time, he turned to Aaron for help. Now, around January, Sean got kicked out of rehab (laughs) just a few days before he would have completed the 28-day rehab program. And when he got kicked out of rehab, he really started communicating with Aaron again. His ex-girlfriend, who he had remained friends with, noticed a change in him around this time. So apparently, like, around the time when he really started talking to Aaron, he kind of, you know, his personality changed and everything like that. On March 10th, 2006, right before 9 p.m., Eric made a 911 call. Someone was at his home and he needed officers to come and help him remove this intruder. After a while, though, Eric said the intruder left on his own and no further assistance was needed. Seven minutes later, another 911 call came in, but this time someone had been shot. Police were dispatched and when they arrived, the intruder was found dead. Aaron met with officers, but Eric was nowhere to be found. Now, here's where we're going to deviate from our normal format, just because of the way this story unfolds. So let's figure out what happened here. We're going to start with Aaron's story. And Aaron's story came courtesy of Katie Allison Grandju on her Because I Said So blog. And if you want to read the whole story from her blog, which is Aaron's half of the story. Uh, If you go to our website, when you go to the show notes, the link will be in the show notes. So it starts off with Aaron speaking, quote, I desperately wanted to create the love and family that I felt I had never had. I feel that when I became a mother at 18, I missed out on a lot of experiences and many of my friends left me. Which is true. Like when you have a kid, most of your childless friends no longer have anything in common with you and they move on. Right, because they don't have a baby. They have a normal childhood. 
Exactly. And I was going to say, Shar, didn't you have a kid at 18? Yeah, but I was married. I'm not saying you weren't. I didn't oh, say, I didn't get your you? Point. Yes. Good Lord. It, and you know what? Not only that, but I was all the way in Europe. So I did. It was like I was completely removed from, oh. you know, normal childhood, you know, like your friends and things yeah, like that. So, so you already lonely. didn't have your friends around you. Right. And mm-hmm. it was back in the day. So it's not like they could even call you. It was probably and, really expensive. Yeah, no back Facebook then to make... or... <laughs> Yeah, or so like you a just, DM or yeah, you were just was, alone. It was, it was weird. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. So she goes on to say that her and Eric had struggled struggled through poverty, and you know they didn't have any help to try and live life. Basically, they were just doing it on their own. So this basically sounds like every person I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was saying that he was continuously sacrificing everything for his music. And, you know, she was sacrificing for her study of English. And then they are both sacrificing everything for their children. And then she goes on to say, quote, people have portrayed me as some kind of party girl drew in my marriage. But do you really think I would have time to keep up the grades that I have worked and taken care of my kids while partying all the time? No, I couldn't have. We both were loving and involved parents, and I did most of the care of the children. Actually, the first time I've heard of anyone telling me I was a bad parent was on March 10, 2006, when Eric's parents suddenly called child welfare authorities. So, Aaron says that their marriage was a happy one, but there were serious issues in it as well. As she Hmm. says, she was 100% faithful to Eric, but he cheated on her at least twice. Wow. She said, like we said before, the primary thing that they sacrificed during their marriage was time together. They just didn't have time for each other. You know, they went off and they attended college. They raised children and they were really, really hands on with their children. They worked full time. They worked part time, you know, and they were able to do all of this stuff in shifts so that the children always had at least one parent there. But... They never made time for each other. For themselves, yeah. And then according to her, Eric was always performing with rock bands and at the university music program. So, you know, she's saying that he was never around also. So she says, quote, it particularly hurts me that anyone is now claiming that Eric was the primary caregiver for our two sons, as it's clear from all the activities in which he engaged that he was never home. This is what she says. Wow, that's, well, I don't know. (laughs) This is what she says. So we'll have two sides of the story. Aaron also claims that at time, Eric would just turn violently angry for no reason, just violently angry for no reason. According to her, in the early 90s, he was arrested in Luton County for trying to shoot someone with a crossbow. But no one could find a record of this because it was expunged from his records. She also claims that in Indiana, she woke up one night to Eric randomly threatening her with a Bowie knife um, that she was able to overtake him and take from him. And then she was like, "Uh, I'm not going to report this. I'll just throw this in a dumpster, not in our house for some reason, but in a dumpster somewhere else. Then because she was some type of superhero, she was like, I can take a knife from my husband and I don't have to report it to anybody. So is this the same story? What happened to the super husband? I mean, this is her side of the story. Yes. Yeah, because it was a whole different picture that was painted. And I was just, I had a way up on this pedal stool. If you're listening. So let me continue. She also says that in 2001, officers were dispatched to their home because they had been arguing inside their car. Like they were sitting inside, they were sitting out in front of the house, just arguing inside their car. And then for some reason... Eric just snapped and he rammed his car into their other car that was parked in the driveway. However, there's like no record of this either because she convinced police not to arrest him or I don't know, but there's no record of this either. Finally, she claims that Eric stalked a college professor and told Aaron that he was going to kill him because he failed him in class. So he did all of this. But there's no record of it. So this (laughs) is her story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving on to 2006. So she was saying in fall of 2006, she basically didn't spend time with Eric except when they were sleeping. Um, You know, during those months, he was exhausted and, 
they really didn't even do any, like not even eye contact. Like they just like past each other in the hallway. Hey, you got the, the wind, kids. Yeah. I'll be home at six. I'll be home. Okay. Yeah. I'll be. yeah. This is according to her. So, you know, and then just randomly, he would just curse her out just for no reason. He would just curse her out. Um, she said he didn't come home until 3 a.m., sometimes 7 a.m., and he didn't feel like he owed her an explanation. So my thing is, I thought he was, like, working a lot from what... No, I, well, maybe he was well, and he didn't come home until 3. I mean... Yeah, let me let me go with what she said. I don't want to put my opinion into what she said. Yeah. So this is what she's saying. So sometimes he came home at 3 a.m., sometimes he came home at 7 a.m., and he was like, mind your business. I, I was where I was. What you want? Yeah, but what about delivering pizzas? Maybe he was delivering pizzas. People... Look, woman, pizza mind your business. You know your place. <laughs> go in that kitchen and fix me a sandwich. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> And she said she felt really, really lonely and she lost weight because she was really, really depressed. Yeah. So, you know, she said one evening in October 2006, she went to speak with Eric and she said, I was like, you know what, Eric, you're never here and none of my needs for like a friend or a relationship are being met at all. And he was like, mm hmm. And I said, you know what? The less I get from you, the more I'm going to need from other people. And then he said, <laughs> oh, there's a different speech there. I never heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I really don't give a shit. And then, according to her, this is her quote. And then he took the jump, the jump drive that had all the work that I had done for graduate school and my master's degree. And he no. threw it across the room and it ended up in the fireplace. And then I said, Eric, if you don't find that jump drive, I'm going to just leave you for that. So, OK, Eric, you had one job, just one. Be a husband. Yeah, <laughs> could do it. <laughs> then she claims that in the winter of 2006, Eric had a psychotic break. He just, you know, he came over to her. He told her that he destroyed everything that was important in his life. And he began, began crying hysterically. And he was just crying like all day and all night. And she told him that she, that, you know, I think you need psychiatric help. You know, this, this behavior is not normal. And I think you need psychiatric help. And she says, she, she says that she accused him of being a drama queen. So... <laughs> But she said, you know, at that time, you know, she was kind of like dead inside. She was just exhausted and, you know, she just couldn't deal with everything that was going on with him. And she felt like he was smothering her. You know, it went from we don't look at each other to suddenly yeah, he's all to he's on just her. Super like, needy. Yeah. And she was Emotionally like, needy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So she says, as of now, she regrets the way she handled this, but. At the time, this is what was going on with her emotionally. And then she said at another time, a psychiatrist recommended that Eric be hospitalized and keep it in line with no evidence to support anything she's saying. She thought it was a bad idea and she told him, you know, Eric, it's not a damn emergency when I'm depressed. So, he, <laughs> so you're he, not getting any help either. Yeah. So he was buddy. like, all right, well, I guess, you know. <laughs> I guess I won't get any help. So My there's own. no. So basically, you know, I'm just going to help you out where there be not being any record of anything that you're saying. So I'll just not go get help. So she also claimed that two weeks before his interaction with the intruder, Eric had started taking Lexapro, which is an antidepressant. This is supposedly the first time in ever of ever that he'd ever taken any medication for depression. She says that with all this going on, you know, she didn't want to leave the marriage. You would think somebody would, you know, somebody you're waking up to a knife at your throat. Somebody's taking your life's work and throwing it in the fireplace. Uh, somebody doesn't care if you're lonely. They're not looking at you. You'd think you would leave. But she says, you know, she didn't want to leave the marriage because of her own childhood experiences. And she didn't want her children to go through the same broken family that she did. Wow. So she came up with an idea. The best thing that someone in a failing marriage with a supposedly abusive husband could ever come up with. Light bulb. <laughs> her idea. You ready for it? I'm going to tell you her idea. Let's have an open marriage. Yeah. Ah, here we go again. Okay. <laughs> seems to be. 
It just seems to be the theme <laughs> in a lot of our crazy cases. So wow. the plan was basically to stay together for the sake of the kids, but then they would both be romantically with other people. And according to her, Eric was like, yeah, sure, fine, cool, let's do it. <laughs> um, he's a man, and he didn't have any other standards, so why not, hun? Let's go for it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Can we start tonight? <laughs> <laughs> why wait? I got somebody in the why closet wait? right now. <laughs> exactly. Come on out, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so Aaron met Sean Powell when his file came across her desk in fall of 2006. She said that after learning about his background, she was impressed by the way, she was impressed by the way he dealt with the trauma of his childhood and she identified with him. Remember I said this dude was basically an alcoholic and like he was fighting people and she was impressed and by the way. Out of every everything. Every program. <laughs> Not that I'm saying he's a bad person because he's just... You know, his childhood was really He's chaotic troubled. and I don't really think he had help for that. So I'm not saying this about him, but for her to say she was impressed with how he dealt with his trauma, which he didn't deal with his trauma. He never he was, dealt with anything. Exactly. So I'm like, record. what are you talking about? What did he deal with? I don't know. But anyways, so she said she identified with him. She took an hmm. interest in his st studies and encouraged him to try harder and be better in school. So she was just a good Samaritan. She had a meeting with his parents and asked them if he could attend tutoring with her at 8 a.m., mm, which he did. According to her, this was the only face-to-face -face meeting she had with Sean outside of class until January 5th. But we'll get to that. When Sean was expelled, Aaron says she was devastated because someone should have been there to support him. And apparently that person should have been her so she was completely devastated by this. So she went to one of her teachers. The way, you know, she's a student teacher. So she went to one of her, I don't know what you would call it, her boss teachers, a teacher that's helping her, overseeing her. I don't know what you would call that. To find out what they can do for Sean. And he, the teacher she went to, he did support Sean during the school's disciplinary hearing. But he advised her to keep her professional distance. Now, how many teachers do you know just say, hey, you know, you're really worried about this child. Keep your professional distance. There had to be something like he saw that teacher saw something for him to be like, keep your professional distance. Yeah, but, but I thought it was because of the age. Also, a student teacher means you're a student in the same high school. So, of course, you can have a love interest outside of it no a student teacher well, you're an adult she had gone to she was in her second uh she was on her way to her second master's degree she's a grown oh, college woman. student teacher yes you know i'm thinking but she's in okay. high school getting her internship to gotcha. become a teacher yeah yeah Good lord shark keep up yeah but that's really common anyway you know for a, a graduate or some okay some let's say a teacher in her 20s and she could have, I don't know, she could have graduated a few years ago. But the point is, many times it's not unusual to fall, like to have affection for your students. Because especially if you're a hot looking teacher. I mean, come on, it happens. <laughs> it happens. It's not that unusual to develop feelings for your students. I'm going to tell you right now, you listeners out there, ignore everything Shar is saying. Because... If one of y'all look um, are a teacher and you look at my child just just slightly wrong, we will be doing a special episode of Love and Murder. <laughs> I agree with you, Kai, but I'm just saying it really is a thing out there. It is. An I issue. know it's a thing. That doesn't make okay. it right. Y'all are still no, gross and wrong. I agree. But anyways, so he told her to keep his professional distance. And he also said, if you want to fix this one, it's going to take the rest of your life. So meaning that he's unfixable, which... I mean, by the time you're an adult, it kind of is too late. I mean, it's, it's going it, to, it's up to that person to want to be fixed. However, I, th you know what? I don't want to say this because I was going to say, I think when he was younger, people just gave up on him. But being an adoptive parent, I don't know how difficult that is because, you know, he, like, when he first came to the adoptive parents, it was smooth sailing. And then just all of a sudden, it was a downhill a downhill I don't know what you would call it everything Spiral. just went down everything just went downhill so yeah. I don't know if I would have I don't know I don't know how I would have dealt with it if I would have sent him off to a boarding school 
or as I, or if I would have tried to deal with it in my house. I I don't know. I because you see you watch movies like um oh my god, what is that movie with that girl who kept hurting her brother? Oh my god. It was a little girl who kept hurting her brother and it turned out that she was a psychopath and it turned out she was like that because her father was molesting her when she was at home. Do you know the movie oh, I'm talking about? No, I don't. But oh my god, what is that like movie? A, it just sounds it's like a story. It's based on a true so story. It's based yeah. on a true story, and I watched the little girl. They they interviewed the the real little girl, and oh my god, this this poor poor wow. child. I felt so bad for her, but I do like that movie, and I uh, I'm gonna put it in our Facebook fan page whenever I remember this. Movie. Remember the name of the movie? Yeah, the because movie, y'all yeah. have to watch. Is it? It's not child of mine, but y'all have to watch this movie. But anyways, you know, it was basically, you know, you see movies like that and you, 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 I don't know. I, I don't even know. You kind of like wonder if this is how your adoptive child is going to turn out if they start acting up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I've thought about that. Like if I were to adopt, which I would have loved to adopt, I'm, I, I think with my child she's she's in uh she's in high school now I don't think I need more children it's like I'm ending (laughs) and then I'm starting over but I would have I would have loved to adopt but you can't help but wonder if the adoptive child is going to like turn out like you know these things that you see in in movies but then again they could turn into a hellraiser and literally kill your whole family but then i was about to say but then again so could your own child how many people did we like like jennifer pan she killed her whole family so yeah she sure did i mean you you definitely cannot just say hey adopted child they might blood yeah they might not because i know i actually know one of my really good friends in high school she was my best friend in high school she was adopted and she was a wonderful person so i mean I don't know. I just think he he should have had more help when he was younger. Again, I'm not blaming the adoptive parents because it's probably hard being adoptive parents in the first place. But I think the system should have knowing where he came from, knowing what kind of life he came from. They should have at least given him help in the beginning before they sent him off to a family. I, you know, that's something that, that, that should be prevalent in the system. And I know they're not, they just churn children out. You know, people say, I want to foster, they send them to foster care. And, you know, a lot of people get abused or, or, that's um, what happened to him in foster though. care. That's what I'm saying. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So not only did he have a bad childhood, but then mm-hmm. he went into foster care thinking that he was going to be safe and he wasn't yeah. safe the whole time. So never. Mm-hmm. he has a lot of issues and it was never figured out. Um, and now he's in, he's a, he's grown because he's 18. So I at this point in time, when you're this old, it's not up to other people to fix you. It's up to you to fix yourself. You exactly. know, no, nobody can and do it's anything. It's so sad because he but he he never had a chance. He never had a chance. He didn't, you know, but the last, but fam- he but the couldn't. last family, I mean, what about the last family? I thought they were good to the him. The family who it's- adopted him, yeah, they were good to him. But imagine you had an entire childhood of abuse yeah. and, and mistreatment. And then you probably Confusion. came to a good family. And then you're mm-hmm. probably scared that they're going to do that to you. So you probably the start same acting thing, yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what happened. Well, he probably started feeling way. comfortable. And he was like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't want to feel comfortable. I can't feel gonna... this way. This is not yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. So something's going to happen to me. You know, that's horrible. Yeah. So I don't know. Wow. <sighs> Poor children. I don't know how people mm-hmm. could be horrible to children. But anyways, um, so... Aaron then reached out to Sean's adopted mother and, you know, told her that they could try and handle a uh, hire a lawyer at the university legal aid, aid clinic. And according to her, his adoptive mother was worried that by her help in Sean, it would risk her pr- position as a student teacher. And, you know, she was like, you know, this is what Aaron said. She said that I care more about the person than I do my job. She was very, very <laughs> noble. So, mm-hmm. Sean returned her call when she left a she left a uh, message for his adopted mom. He's the one who returned the call and in trying to help him somehow over their months while they were talking and she's supposedly trying to help him, their conversation became intimate and sexual. I mean, usually when I'm trying to help people, 
somehow somewhere along their lines i go from you know we can get you therapy to no you, we can get in bed he <laughs> bow chicka wow wow <laughs> how did how did she make that crossover like yeah that's crazy it is crazy but so you don't, but you don't see i mean we're still talking about the student teacher of course right mm-hmm. okay so do you realize that because a lot of the student teachers are probably young like i said maybe just fresh out of college or maybe in their early 20s and when you're a teenager and you're 18 or 17 or you know it's easy for your hormones to get confused you have this probably hot looking teacher and, you know, she's only a few years maybe older than you. It's just there's a fine line there. I could see why that a happened. A few so years. Often. He was born in 1988 and she was born in 1977. So she's 11 years older than him. That is OK. That's a huge difference. Yeah. If his hormones are raging, that's just who he is. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's not, not like she was a 21-year-old like student super, teacher. Super hot, young, you know, student teacher. I yeah, get, yeah so. that makes sense. I got a better visual now. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I was about to say. I mean, I know when I was in my 30s, I was looking for a relationship with a teenager. Yeah, I was just out there like, any teenagers <laughs> want to be with what, a 30-something? What, behind the ears with acne? Anybody? Uh, but <laughs> on, on the real, though, I was in my 30s. I had my daughter. So she was like a baby and some little dude, I'm walking like in the park with my daughter and some little dude comes up to me and he was like, Hey, can I have your number? And I'm looking at this dude. Like how old are you little boy? <laughs> he was like 15. Oh, and I was wow. like, dude, how old do you think I am? He was like, you're my age, aren't you? Do oh, you not see the, actually. <laughs> I was like, do you not see the whole baby on my arm? And he was like, well, yeah, but, you know, I guess, you know, I'm not thinking. I'm thinking, like, I would never have a baby at 15. Not that I'm judging, but my mom would have murdered me. She literally would have murdered me. So it's, I'm not judging whoever had a baby at 15. I'm just saying I wouldn't be here to do this podcast today. So Right, and it's, it's no fault of your own. You just would have been wiped off the earth. Exactly. But, so so I can't even... Go get a glass of milk together or something? <laughs> you know? So I couldn't, like, I wouldn't fathom even having a baby at 15. So when I'm saying, do you see the baby? I'm thinking, do you see the adult standing here? But he's yeah. thinking, you know, I could have had a baby. I was like, dude, I'm like 30. And then that's when he changed his, his, whole, his whole rap, like, oh, age ain't nothing but a number. And I was like, are you serious, little boy? I said, so by your your logic is that when my friends ask me where my dude is, I'll be like, oh, he's in homeroom right now. I'll go yeah, get exactly. him from his mom's house after he finishes his homework tonight. I was like, are you freaking kidding me, boy? If you don't get out my face, little boy, whatever. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. According to her, she said that Eric was completely aware of hers and Sean's relationship and he was trying to be OK with it. So in an email, which Aaron says Eric sent to Open Marriage Expert Online, which there is actual evidence about something for once Finally. in her entire story. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read this email to y'all. And it was sent on December 28th, 2006. Subject, Open Marriage. Question. I have been married for 10 years. My wife has lost interest in me sexually and she wants to have an open marriage. I want her to be happy, but I'm probably going to have major jealousy issues. I'm not interested in any other woman, but I believe she is interested in a specific young man. And then he has in parentheses late teens. I'm 31 and my wife is 29. Now that we have discussed the possibility of having an open marriage, I keep getting mental pictures of other men with my wife, so much so that I get sick to my stomach and irritated. Again, I want her to be happy. I know that she doesn't desire me anymore, which means I can't satisfy her needs, but I don't know how this will work. Also, she's very attractive, so she won't have any trouble getting any number of suitors in the future. And men are probably more open to the idea of having sex with another man's wife than women are to, uh, than women are to having sexual relations with a married man. I'd imagine that a woman would probably demand I break off my relationship with my wife. That is, if I become interested in another woman. 
do I sound like a bad candidate from open marriage? End quote. So that's the end of the email. So first of all, what I see here, the only evidence that we actually have of what she said that he did, which is send an email from the email here, this does not describe him at all. He said, my wife is attractive. I want her to be happy. This everything that I'm reading here matches the the uh, description of the man that we said in the beginning of this episode. The original that we thought exactly. was just the most amazing husband. Yes. Exactly. So Committed nothing in this email yeah. matches how she says he is. So how do we know he wrote that email? <laughs> right. That could be her who wrote it. <laughs> but I'm sure if, <laughs> but I'm sure if she wrote it, she would have made it sound all mean and evil. Like she's an ugly hag and she's fat. <laughs> Nobody's going to want her. And so she yeah. could be like, see, well, she's the see? victim. See, exactly. I told you. I exactly. Told you. So I'm pretty sure he wrote this. So. Anyways, the expert answered him that, yeah, you sound like a terrible candidate for an open relationship. And, you know, she suggested instead that they go to either counseling or get a divorce. Basically, this person sounds like they're talking to me because I would be a terrible candidate for an open marriage. I because it would be like, you know, my husband says, can we have an open marriage you know, basically telling me you disgust me. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm not interested in you in anymore, but I'll stay with you ah, uh, just to throw you a bone. So first of all, I feel like shit now. So it's like, he doesn't even love me anymore. Like maybe I need to like get plastic surgery or exercise, like buy wigs. I don't know. So that's number one. The next thing is if I say yes to an open marriage because I'm trying to make him happy, I am just like Eric. I will be picturing every woman with my husband. Every time <laughs> I close my eyes, I'll be like, is he really at work where he's at that bitch's right. house? Isn't he like, <laughs> what and he, 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 yeah, he met that hot blonde at Starbucks with the big boobs like Shar. I'll be yeah. tracking whenever he gets <laughs> off of work. Okay. He said he's off. He should be here in 20 minutes, 22 minutes. He's at that bitch's it's house. 23. Isn't he? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't be where able to you? deal. I would it's not be able to there. deal. Yeah. The insecure. I mean, yeah. Fuck. You have an open no, relationship. No, I'm saying that that's real insecurity because you have a reason. Oh yeah. It I, never goes away though. I would it's, not just, be <laughs> able to function. I would not be able to function. I'll be looking at his clothes, sniffing his clothes. Ah, is that <laughs> perfume? <laughs> like I couldn't. I couldn't. I'll I, have, all... I have no problem with that. I actually would. I would definitely agree to it, just depending on the who the man was, the my husband, like who that husband was. So. You would, I do, you would agree with it for your yeah. side or for his side? No, on my side and his side. Yeah, no. absolutely. Because remember, I'm open to pol the possibility of polygamy. So now open marriage is a lot different, though. You're just helter skelter. You just meet someone at the mall. Hey, let's go have let's go. I mean, uh, anyway, it's just whoever. There's no rules. Not yeah, really. You no. can tell or not tell. You can share or not share as far as the information of like, this is what happened. Look who I met today. I but don't, it wouldn't bother me. I don't me. want to know. Even if I'm okay with an open marriage, I don't want to know. Tell me you're on your <laughs> way to the movies. Tell me you're going to the post office. Don't yeah. tell me I'm tell going me to anything go. anything but. Yeah, go exactly. And like this I'll is. this is six for dinner. And especially if I know <laughs> what this woman looks like, I will pick yeah. her apart. Like, oh, is her, is her hair <laughs> thicker than mine? Is it because her eyelashes are longer than me? Is, you know, is it because she's lighter or darker? Like, I will pick everything apart. It, it, it won't work for me. It just won't work for me. Yeah, you would be so miserable because you'll never have peace. I would Because like you never. said, every moment you have a reason to be insecure. Exactly. Any, I mean, it totally, it's a setup. I would be it's a setup miserable. For failure. <laughs> miserable. Yeah. Anyways, um, she said that when, so remember I said that Sean was kicked out and she said when he was kicked out of his house or sorry, out of the um, rehab, he, uh, he called he called her. He didn't call his adoptive mom. He called her. And it was Eric who called him back. But Eric called him back because she was like, call him back. Call him back. Come on, just call him back. See what he wanted. Like, it's like, why are you pushing him to call him back? Why didn't you just call him back? So anyways, Eric called him back and he was like, yeah, I got kicked out of rehab. I need to be picked up. I don't have anybody to pick me up. And so Eric went and picked him up. Because again, she was like, go pick him up, go pick him up, go pick, like what game is she playing? 
So Eric went to pick Sean up from rehab and uh, she t- he also took him so, uh, this this spinach pita platter thing that Aaron had made. And then he dropped Sean off somewhere where he could stay for the night. And then the next morning, her, Eric, the kids and Eric's mom went to pick Sean up from this place he was staying from for the night and took him to church with them. And they asked him why, you know, basically, I'm pretty sure it was Eric who asked him, why aren't you at home? Why didn't you go home to your mom? Like, what's going on? And Sean said his mom wouldn't let him come home. So after a week, he stayed in that place where um, where Eric originally dropped him off. So after a week, they found him a place to stay, which was in this unsold home of Eric's father's. Eric's father was a realtor. So this house hadn't sold yet. So Sean stayed in this house. So basically, all the sacrifices coming from Eric's side. But he, the picture she painted was he was this crazed, horrible husband who kept trying to beat her and kill her and everything like that. But anyways, soon after Sean was kicked out of rehab and in her father-in-law's house, rent freaking free, she started having sex with him. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Now, okay, this is getting crazy. Now, according to her, remember, this is all her side. Of, this whole thing here is her side of the story. According to her, Eric knew all about this. According to her, there was even a point in time when Eric tried to initiate a threesome between them. But Sean said no and went off to continue sleeping with Aaron by himself. While Eric was, <laughs> you know, he just went and sulked somewhere else in the house. So basically... What she wants us to believe is that this dude wanted a threesome. The teenager was like, no, man, I'm just going to do your wife by myself. Can you go somewhere else so we can, you know, I got to finish like, mm, mm, bounce, chicken, wow, wow. <laughs> and Eric was like, all right, dude, you know, I understand. I'll just, I'll just be in the living room. If y'all need You're anything. You're kind of in the way. I'm trying to handle something over here. Yeah. If y'all need we'll any ice sandwich. water or something like that, I'll be in the living room. <laughs> just yell, you know. Yeah. This is what she wants us to believe. Anyway, on the night of March 9th, according to Aaron, the children went to spend the night at Eric's family's house and stayed there through the night of March 10th, which she alleged was not normal for them. They'd stayed away from home for more than one night. But according to her, Eric was insistent that they stay at his parents' house over the course of two nights. You see the picture she's trying to paint, right? Yeah. So yeah, on sure March did. 9th, her and Sean went to see a play at the college. And when they got back to the McLean house, you know, her house, Sean and Eric chilled a bit and listened to music together. So they were just chilling like two homies. Then Eric and her went to bed while Sean slept on the couch. When they got to their room, Eric said he wanted to tell her something. But instead of talking, he just stood there. And she says the way he was standing frightened her. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would he have two feet forward or behind? I mean, you know, it was, like you that. Know, I mean, if I saw hey. the way my husband could be standing that frightened me, like he's just standing, nothing in his hand, he's standing. It's like maybe if he was standing facing to me, but his waist, or something? his waist and oh. his bottom part was facing the other way. Then, yeah, I could <laughs> see how that scares me. <laughs> huh. he's, he's just standing there. So yeah. then... On the day of March 10th, Sean woke up and started teasing Eric about his, Sean's, and Aaron's relationship. And so Aaron, being the noble woman she is, told him to stop it and told him to leave, and he did. And as the day day wore on, Eric told her that her best friend had sent him a text telling him to come and spend the night with her. So, you know... Eric said, I'm just telling you this because I'm seriously consider going going to uh, I'm seriously considering going to boink your best friend. So I just wanted to let you know. This Give is you a heads up. Yeah, this is according to her. <laughs> so now, even though Aaron knew they had an open marriage, she thought friends and family should be off limits. So she became angry and then they started arguing. This is just like, wow. So you can do whatever you want, but he can't. Wow. Interesting. So well, there are one sided rules here so that we're going to adhere to them. Obviously. <laughs> so then she had Eric call her friend and ask her friend while while Aaron was standing there if she wanted to sleep with him. 
And she said, yeah. And so that pissed Aaron off even more. So <laughs> at some point in time, Sean had, you know, ESP. And he was like, I think Aaron's in trouble. So he called her and he was like, hey, I just, my spidey sense is tingling. Would you like me to come <laughs> over and pick you up? And according to her, Eric said that if you leave with him, you don't come back. And Aaron was like, you know what? I wasn't going to leave, but now I am. And so she said, yeah, Sean, come pick me up. I'm glad you called out of the blue, out of nowhere. Right. And so Sean showed up in about 15 minutes. And again, according to her, she said Eric just looked weird that night. He just he just looked weird and he was acting strange. And he supposedly had a, quote, wild look in his eye. Mm. What? <laughs> Now, this is, she remembers all of this clear as day, but now this is where it kind of gets fuzzy for her. She can't really remember the events of the night, but she knows that Sean was trying to provoke Eric. All of a sudden, just out of nowhere, Eric called the cops. And as he was on the phone with, with the cops, he called Sean an intruder who had been stalking his wife and saying that he was in their home and to come get him. So confused, and while Eric was on the phone, she asked him, why are you referring to someone who is welcomed in our house on a frequent as basis a as an intruder? An intruder. Now, <laughs> I got to tell you, if she would have said that, wouldn't that have been on the 911 call? Yeah, sure would. Uh, yeah, I thought so. Once again, mysteriously no evidence. So anyways, when you know she said that to him, and Sean realized he was on the phone with the cops. That's when Sean left. He was like, all right, man, I'm leaving. I don't want no problems. This is getting way too dramatic for, yeah. for me. Yeah. So you know? Aaron followed him outside where they sat and talked. Now, at this point, she told Sean to leave. Like, you know, I think you should go. And she also said, I was never planning on leaving Eric. I'm never getting a divorce. I think you need to understand this. Um, I, I, not that I love my husband, but I love my family and I'm not leaving them. I was just sleeping with you. It was an open relationship, but I'm not leaving my husband. And then at this point, right when she's standing up for her husband and her marriage and everything, you know, this is when Eric came outside with that look in his eye and he was like, Hey, yeah, you stay out here. I'm going to lock you out. You know, and then I'm going to get a restraining order against you so that you'll never see your children again. So, you know, that's, that's when she was like, oh, you know what? I was I was sticking up for us. But now that you say that, I, yeah, I'm leaving with Sean. You know, you want me to leave? <laughs> I'm going to leave. So then Sean went to get his car from the front of the house and Aaron went into the house to get her cell phone and her purse. And then that's when she heard a loud noise outside. And she was like, she didn't know what the noise was. So she ran outside. And that's when she found Eric with a gun in his hand standing next to Sean's car. And she said he was, quote, eer eerily calm. And wow. she saw that, you know, she looked in the car and she saw, saw that Sean's head had been blown off. And then she started screaming. His head was blown off. Mm -hmm. And she started screaming. And oh. that's when she said, Eric calmly turned to her and said, congratulations. And that, folks, is part one of the Knoxville Love Triangle. Next week, we will continue with the conclusion, which will be Eric's story and how the case actually unfolded. <laughs> Normally, I would ask what y'all thought about this episode, but right now I know y'all are cussing me out because I just stopped right there. <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say you made me do it, or see what you, see what you made me do, Aaron. You know, well, he just said congratulations. Kind of, that was it. According to yeah, her, I know, but I'm just picturing it. that he said, you know, like you made me do it, <laughs> yeah, or something. To so, that effect. like I said, normally yeah. I would ask y'all what y'all thought about this episode, but I want you to hold on to your thoughts. Like, seriously, remember this episode. Hold on to your thoughts until you hear the insane the other story. conclusion to this case. Like, y'all are not even going to believe this. So tune in next week when we do part two of the Knoxville Love Triangle. Triangle. In the meantime, if you like this story, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, 
if you're still using Spotify, and rate this story five stars. You know what it does. You already know what it does. It helps bring us up in the chart so other people can find us. Um, in the description, when I ask you to write description, you can say whatever, you know, Kai's a piece of shit because she didn't finish this case. She gave us a two-parter. But look, we just finished her story and we're like an hour in. Do you really want a two-hour show? You're probably saying <laughs> yes, but my throat is saying no. So I, am, I apologize. It's a two-parter. Yeah, that was a that was pretty intense. So I give you that. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> Don't forget to go visit us on patreon.com forward slash love and murder and become an exclusive LNM subscriber for our crazy bonus episodes, our behind the scenes. You'll hear we had a whole different conversation inside of our case that's not part that's not part of the show. But if you want to hear our behind the scenes, our bloopers and everything like that, then subscribe to our Patreon for only $3 a month right now. And when the price does go up, guess what? You're going to be locked in at $3 a month and you still get everything. So go to patreon.com forward slash love and murder and you will be an amazing exclusive L and M subscriber. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash relationship crime, Instagram at love murder podcast, Facebook fan group page, our lovely we have amazing fans in there that's where cindy cindy g is love her love her but anyways go to our facebook fan book uh fan group you can search love and murder fan page in google you can also search it in facebook and it will bring you to our fan page and if you just love merch, if you love the merch from some of the stuff we say like stay sexy and don't get murdered or all love and no murder y'all or even just our love and murder logo, you can go to our store, which is if you go to our website, www.murderandlove.com, that's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com. And in the menu above, just click on our shop. You just click on that and you will see we have hoodies, we have t-shirts, we have long sleeve t-shirts, short sleeve t-shirts. <gasps> We have for men, we have for women. <laughs> we have t-shirts, t-shirts, t-shirts. We have and a phone lot more. cases, we have glasses, <laughs> we have tumblers, we have mugs, we have it all. Go and check out our shop. You can get our amazing merch there. And as I always remind you, a free way to support us is by basically hitting the share on this episode. Just hit share and share it with your friends. Share it to your social media, your Instagram, your Twitter, your Facebook. Um, share it to your WhatsApp. Share it to your text message. Look, share it to your email. Look, send a freaking fax of this <laughs> <laughs> of this episode. Whatever. Share, share, share. It's really easy to do. It takes you less than 30 seconds, but it's a great help to us. And we are very, very, very happy that you helped us and very grateful. Now, I want to remind you that it's all, all love and, and no murder, y'all. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>